strike, safe, play ball. Yo, I'm back again today, and today I'm back because I am a African man in America. So that means African American, right? And today I'll be talking about my uh, own ethnicity of, of, of black people, if you wanna say, and I love it so much. Today we're gonna be talking about baseball and we're gonna be talking about the Negro Leagues. Yes, the Negro Leagues. The Negro Leagues, uh, for people that don't know, was a African American baseball league that was uh, developed out of the love for the sport and um, because of the oppression and discrimination of uh, the uh, European settlers or the white people in America that did not want to have black people in the uh, National League in America. So today we'll be talking about that. Let's get right into it. Let's jump right into it. We're back. Yo, get your bats, get your gloves. We're ready. We're back into it. So today we're going to be talking about uh, the Negro Leagues. And there were, we have to understand one thing. There were African-American baseball players that were on the white rosters you know, on the minor league teams, although the original National Association of Baseball Players formed in 1867 had banned um, black athletes. Most of these players fell victim to regional practices and prejudices and unofficial uh, color ban after little time with the white teams. So there was a lot of racism and a lot of backlash for even the African Americans that were on the white teams and they didn't stay for long at all. And in 1884, the Stillwater Minnesota Club in the Northwestern League signed John W. Bud Fowler. And he was an African American with more than decades of experience as a professional player. Fowler um, was a second, um, second baseman by preference, but he could play every position. He was a very good at every position, um, whether it be uh, outfielder, batter, whatever it was. And this enhanced the reputation that brought, you know, the attention to him uh, from the white team owners. And Fowler's, Fowler, Fowler's baseball career continued through uh, the end of the 19th century, but much of it was spent on the rosters of the minor league uh, clubs in the organized baseball. Now, as the season of 1890 began, there were no black players in the International League at all. The most prestigious of the minor league circuits, that's what that was. Without making a formal announcement, the uh, white owners had a gentleman's agreement and that was made which would bar black or African American players from participating for the next 55 years. Um, though black players continued to find work in lesser leagues for a time being, within a, only a few short years, no team would in organized baseball would accept any African American players, and the color barrier was firmly in place at this time. Now, we have to realize, after this ban, there were a few African Americans that still tried to find a place in the organized white American baseball league, but others were advancing in careers in, um, you know, the other league, which was the Negro League, with more than 200 all black independent teams that performed throughout the country in the early 1880s um, and so on. Eastern teams like the powerful Cuban Giants played both independently and loosely organized, um, you know, in loosely organized leagues as well. Through the end of the century and into the, mm, the early 1900s, black baseball started to very much, very much so blossom like a flower, yo, blossom, it blossomed. It was a big thing and uh, African American community uh, started to catch on to it and Now it. in the early uh, 20th century, in the earlier years of the 20th century, there was an emergence of big powerful black clubs in the Midwest, such as uh, teams like the Chicago Giants, the Indianapolis ABCs, the St. Louis Giants, and the Kansas City Monarchs rose to prominence and presented a very, very legitimate challenge in the Negro teams on the East Coast. Um, and the Negro teams on the East Coast were uh, supposedly supposed to be the best and they were the most prestige. And these clubs such as the Lincoln Giants in New York and the Brooklyn Royal Giants and the Cuban Stars were uh, supposedly supposed to be the best. And when the Midwest uh, division of the Negro Leagues, uh, their own division started, um, the East Coast Negro Leagues uh, or the teams in the, uh, the East Coast uh, were very much uh, on top of things and they thought that they were the best. So this introduced a lot of competition and the growth of the uh, 
three sections of the Negro League before it became the um, one number one Negro League. Now, as the East Coast, um, different African American teams in the East Coast were developing, and uh, the Midwest was starting to be uh, become very big and develop, especially in the African American community. Uh, the South team, you know, had. Uh, a couple teams as well and the south teams like the Birmingham uh, Black Barons and the Nashville Standard Giants were building solid big reputations in the south and throughout all of the um, the different Negro leagues whether it be the Midwest the East Coast or the south and at the end of World War one black baseball was one of the highest attractions for African Americans if not the highest especially in the urban population at the time though the most influential african-american personality in baseball and the owner of the chicago american giants was um feeling that the african-americans at the time should unite and create one league um which would enhance the state you know the stableness of the league and also uh organize the negro league and like I stated before, the owner of the Chicago team that was part of the Negro Leagues, um, his name was Andrew Fosters. And Andrew Fosters, under his leadership in 1920, he created the Negro National League, which was born and was uh, matured in Kansas City. With teams such as the Chicago American Giants, the Chicago Giants, the Cuban Stars, the Detroit Stars, the Indianapolis ABCs, uh, as well as the Kansas City Mon Monarchs and the St. Louis Giants. And in the same year, the Negro Southern League was created as well. And in 1923, the East Coast followed suit and created the Eastern Colored League. Now, the Negro National League continued until 1931, in which the Great Depression became a financial burden on the league, and this disrupted the Midwest and East Coast teams, leaving only the Negro Southern League in the South. And luckily, there was a bar owner from Pittsburgh who took off where the old league left off and as far as the Northern and Midwest leagues. And in 1937, the Southern Negro League was brought into the Southern to the Northern League and created the Negro American League, becoming the primary force in the black baseball from 1937 to 1949. Now, during this golden age, the best years, the Negro League's biggest attraction was the East Coast and the West Coast All-Star uh, baseball game. And this was played annually at Chicago's uh, Comiskey Park. This was indeed the most popular game and this showed the newest, the best players, and as well as brought in the biggest revenue for African Americans in uh, the African American community. Now, as World War II came to a close, there was an uproar of injustice and, you know, inequality um, by African Americans. And African Americans had, at this point, fought in the war and had shown that their skills were superior, if not on par with any major white leagues uh, baseball players. This was the down spiral at this point for the Negro Leagues, and in 1946, um, Jackie Robinson was signed to the Dodgers, and the color barrier was cracked at that point. And after this event, many African Americans players would follow suit and leave the Negro Leagues and join the white leagues. And this would also result to an event by 1952, there were 150 African American players in the white league. With African Americans going to the White League, this devastated the Negro Leagues, you know, and you could only probably only imagine how it would devastate them, and in many ways. And the most talented players left to play in the integrated teams, with this all of a sudden shock and, and, and this all of a sudden absent of African Americans in the uh, Negro Leagues, the black team owners witnessed a decline in um, attendance, a decline in um, uh, fin you know finances. Uh, there was a big financial struggle because if you don't have the biggest players, um, you know no one's going to watch you. No one's going to come to your 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 venue and, and watch them play baseball. And this led to African Americans uh, watching the ma major white league instead of the Negro League. So the Negro National League disbanded after this 1949 season, never to return again, ever, ever to return again. Um, after a long successful run, black baseball senior circuit was no longer a valuable commercial enterprise. It wasn't making money. It wasn't something that people wanted to go see at that point. Um, and though the Negro American League continued on to the, throughout the 1950s, it had lost the bulk of its talent and 
virtually all his fan appeal has uh, was gone, and, and, and all of the Negro League's fans were in the uh, major white league now, uh, and they wanted to watch the you know their favorite players there. So after a dec decade of operating as a shadow of its former self. Uh, the league closed its doors for good in 1962, and that was the last time and last games that were played in the Negro Leagues.
What's up? What's up? Hey. Shalom. What up? Hi. Hi. 